Person-Centered Planning, Wikipedia Article Audio Person-Centered Planning is a set of approaches designed to assist an individual to plan their life and supports. It is most often used for life planning with people with learning and developmental disabilities, though recently it has been advocated as a method of planning personalized support with many other sections of society who find themselves disempowered by traditional methods of service delivery, including children, people with physical disabilities, people with mental health issues and older people. PCP is accepted as evidence-based practice in many countries throughout the world. Background Person-centered planning was adopted as government social policy in the United Kingdom through the Valuing People White Paper in 2001, and as part of Valuing People Now, a three-year plan, in 2009. It is promoted as a key method for delivering the personalization objectives of the UK government's Putting People First program for social care. The coalition government continued this commitment through capable communities and active citizens, and in 2011 over 30 health and social care organisations set up a sector-wide agreement Think Local, Act Personal to Transform Adult Social Care. Person-centered planning discovers and acts on what is important to a person. It is a process for continual listening and learning, focusing on what are important to someone now and in the future, and acting on this in alliance with their family and their friends. Methods Person-centered planning was created in response to some specific problems with the way in which society responds to people with disabilities. Those who first described the processes were responding to the effects that services can have on people's lives. In this context services refers to the organizations which are set up to help people in relation to their disability. It would include health and social care services funded by government or local authorities, but also privately funded or voluntary sector projects of many kinds. Limitations Person-centered planning has similarities to other processes and ideas, but was first named and described more definitely by a group of people in the U.S., including the Center on Human Policy's Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Community Integration e.g., Julianne Raisino, Zana Lutfiya, Steve Taylor, John O'Brien, Beth Mount, Connie Lyle O'Brien, Technical Assistance Partners of the RRTC and Person-Centered Planning in Canada by Jack Pearpoint, Judith Snow and Marcia Forrest. Whilst it was developed because of the social and service response to disability, it was quickly recognized to be as useful for many other individuals and groups of people. Outcomes Disabled people in the UK and USA developed the social model of disability, arguing for a shift in the balance of power between people and the services on which they rely. Person-centered planning is based in the social model of disability because it places the emphasis on transforming the options available to the person, rather than on fixing or changing the person. Specifically person-centered planning was based diversely on principles of community integration slash inclusion slash normalization slash social role valorization. Prior to its inception, these principles were crystallized by John O'Brien and Connie Lyle O'Brien in the Framework for Accomplishment which listed five key areas important in shaping people's quality of life and asserting that services should be judged by the extent to which they enable people to. The title person-centered is used because those who developed it and used it initially shared a belief that services tend to work in a service-centered way. This service-centered behavior appears in many forms, but an example is that a person who is isolated would be offered different groups to attend rather than being helped to make friends in ordinary society. 
The person-centered concept grew out of the critique of the facility-based services approach in the U.S. that was central to the development of support approaches in the U.S. The nationwide technical assistance funded by the National Institute on Disability Research and Rehabilitation, which included the person-centered approaches, is reported in the Journal of Vocational Rehabilitation. A central idea behind person-centered planning, is that services which are set up to respond to problems of social exclusion, disempowerment and evaluation, can unintentionally make the situation of individual people worse. Person-centered planning is designed specifically to empower people, to directly support their social inclusion, and to directly challenge their devaluation. One of the benefits of person-centered planning is that it can address the perennial service problems of ethnicity, gender, culture, and age by starting with planning by or with the whole person. Person-centered planning is not one clearly defined process, but a range of processes sharing a general philosophical background, and aiming at similar outcomes. As it has become more well-known further processes and procedures have also been given the title person-centered planning. Some of these have little in common with person-centered planning as originally envisaged. Person-centered planning through the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Community Integration in the U.S. was, in part, an agency and systems change process as opposed to only an individual planning process moving to an individual budgeting process. Person-centered planning involves the individual receiving the service, with family members, neighbors, employers, community members, and friends, and professionals developing a plan on community participation and quality of life with the individual. In contrast, traditional models of planning have focused on the person's deficits and negative behaviors, labeling the person and creating a disempowering mindset from the start. Person-centered planning offers an alternative to traditional models, striving to place the individual at the center of decision-making, treating family members as partners. The process focuses on discovering the person's gifts, skills, and capacities, and on listening for what is really important to the person. It is based on the values of human rights, interdependence, choice and social inclusion, and can be designed to enable people to direct their own services and supports, in a personalized way. Person-centered planning utilizes a number of techniques with the central premise that any methods used must be reflective of the individual's personal communication mechanisms and assist them to outline their needs, wishes, and goals. There is no differentiation between the process used and the output and outcomes of the PCP, instead, it pursues social inclusion through means such as community participation, employment, and recreation. Beth Mount characterized the key similarities or family resemblances of the different person-centered methods and approaches into four themes. Person-centered thinking skills, total communication techniques, graphic facilitation of meetings and problem-solving skills are some methods commonly used in the development of a person-centered plan, as are path, circles of support, maps, personal futures planning, essential lifestyle planning, person-centered reviews, getting to know you, and most recently the use of person-centered thinking tools to build from one-page profiles into person-centered descriptions slash collections of person-centered information and on into full-scale plans. The resultant plan may be in any format that is accessible to the individual, such as a document, a drawing, or an oral plan recorded onto a tape or compact disc. Multimedia techniques are becoming more popular for this type of planning as development costs decrease and the technology used becomes more readily available. Plans are updated as and when the individual wishes to make changes, 
or when a goal or aspiration is achieved. If part of a regular planning process in the U.S., regular plan updates are usually required by regulatory agencies. Person-centered planning can have many effects that go beyond the making of plans. It can create a space during which someone who is not usually listened to has central stage. It can insist that discussion is centered on what the person is telling us is important to them, with their words and behaviors, as well as what others feel is important for the person. It can engage participants personally by allowing them to hear of deeply felt hopes and fears. It can assist people in a circle of support to reframe their views of the person it is focused on. It can help a group to solve difficult problems. In the U.S., person-centered planning can help to create new lifestyles, new homes, and jobs, diverse kinds of support and new social relationships. Many of the limitations discussed below reflect challenges and limitations in the implementation of person-centered planning approaches in the context of formal human service systems. Another approach to this question is to envision person-centered planning as an approach that is anchored in the person's natural community and personal relationship network. In this view, the person-centered plan offers a platform for the person and their trusted allies to identify and express their vision and commitments without limiting that expression to what can or will be provided by the service system. Share ordinary places make choices, develop abilities, be treated with respect and have a valued social role, grow in relationships. Some time later, the formal system can develop a plan for service delivery that may be based on and consistent with the person's plan, that recognizes and supports the contributions of the person, family, and community and that clearly acknowledges the limitations of what the system is prepared to provide. John O'Brien sums up the problem of trying to deliver person-centeredness through formal service systems that have a very different culture thus. Many human service settings are zones of compliance in which relationships are subordinated to and constrained by complex and detailed rules. In those environments, unless staff commit themselves to be people's allies and treat the rules and boundaries and structures as constraints to be creatively engaged as opposed to simply conforming, person-centered work will be limited to improving the conditions of people's confinement in services. He calls for leadership to challenge these boundaries. Most service organizations have the social function of putting people to sleep keeping them from seeing the social reality that faces people with disabilities, people go to sleep when the slogan that we are doing the best that is possible for them distracts from noticing and taking responsibility for the uncountable losses imposed by service activities that keep people idle, disconnected, and alienated from their own purposes in life. One way to understand leadership is to see it as waking up to people's capacities and the organizational and systemic practices that devalue and demean those capacities. A key obstacle to people achieving better lives has been the risk-averse culture that has been prevalent in human services for a variety of reasons. Advocates of person-centered thinking argue that applying person-centered thinking tools to the risk decision-making process, and finding strategies that are based on who the person is, can enable a more positive approach to risk that doesn't use risk as an excuse to trap people in boring and unproductive lives. The key advocates of PCP and associated person-centered approaches warn of the danger of adopting the model in a bureaucratic way adopting the form of PCP, without the philosophical content. By changing it to fit existing practices rather than using it in its original form, most or all of its effects are lost. The hope of funding it in the USA was to influence the processes, 
such as planning through the Medicaid home and community-based waiver services for people moving from institutions to the community. The philosophical content expects services to be responsive to the needs of people that use the service, rather than prescriptive in the types of services offered. These principles are reliant on mechanisms such as individualized funding packages and the organizational capacity to design and deliver support services. It is essential that organizations and agencies providing services make a commitment to strive for person-centeredness in all of their activities, which can result in major changes in areas of practice such as recruitment, staff training, and business planning and management. While secondary users may debate the use of person-centered approaches to achieve the myriad goals it attempts to achieve, i.e., increased inclusion. Defining person-centeredness, others point to recent research such as the impact of person-centered planning, which suggests that person-centered planning can make a considerable difference to people's quality of life and explores the optimum conditions for person-centered approaches. Valuing People Now says Person-centered planning has been shown to work. The world's largest study into person-centered planning described how it helps people get improvements in important parts of their lives and indicated that this was at no additional cost. However it continues. Too few people have access to proper person-centered planning. In too many local authorities, person-centered planning is not at the center of how things are done. The challenge of the next three years is to take all this innovative work and make sure that more and eventually all people have real choice and control over their lives and services. Person-centered planning in the USA has continued to be investigated at the secondary research level and validated for more general use. Local authorities in Britain are now being challenged by government to change their model to one that is founded on person-centered approaches. This move is from the model of care, where an individual receives the care determined by a professional, to one that has person-centered planning at its heart, with the individual firmly at the center in identifying what is personally important to deliver his or her outcomes. The government recognizes that this will require a fundamental change in the way services are organized and think. Personalization is about whole system change. In New York State, the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities has mandated the use of person-centered planning in all new service development for people with intellectual disabilities. Person-centered planning is central to the new approaches to person-directed supports with are based on stronger self-determination than traditional person-centered approaches. Person-centered thinking and planning is founded on the premise that genuine listening contains an implied promise to take action. Unless what is learned about how the person wishes to live, and where they wish to go in their lives is recorded and acted upon, any planning will have been a waste of time, and more importantly a betrayal of the person and the trust they have placed in those who have planned with them. In the UK initiatives such as individual budgets and self-directed supports using models like in control mean that person-centered planning can now be used to directly influence a person's support planning, giving them direct control over who delivers their support, and how it is delivered. Seeing people first, rather than diagnostic labels, using ordinary language and images, rather than professional jargon, actively searching for a person's gifts and capacities in the context of community life, strengthening the voice of the person, and those who know the person best in accounting for their history, evaluating their present conditions in terms of valued experiences and defining desirable changes in their life.